And good afternoon from Philadelphia. Frank here with yet another episode of UFO News Network Sunday, today on a Saturday. And uh, I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Chant Hannah. Chant, how are you today? I'm great. How are you, Frank? Uh, Doing good. Uh, Ready to go. We've got a fantastic guest for us today. So why don't you tell the people all about him and what we're going to be going over? We have a very special guest. His name is Tom Whitmore, very well-known person in the UFO community. Uh, he's a longtime MUFON board member, has been a San Antonio, Texas resident since 1984, originally from Tulsa. Tom graduated with a degree in business administration from Portland State University and had a career in the financial industry since the 70s. He was most recently employed as a financial analyst with a local firm in San Antonio, where he retired in 2019. He is an accomplished guitarist and has a grown daughter. Tom was invited to join the MUFON board in 1995 and experienced the organization's progress through the successive administrations of Walt, Andrus, John Schusler, uh, James Carrion, Clifford Clift, Dave McDonald, Jan Harzen, and again... Sorry, I was going to say Dave McDonald again. <laughs> he serves, uh, I guess that, that means twice. We'll have to ask Tom about that in a bit. He serves as treasurer and focuses on long-term and strategic issues for the organization. Tom has been fascinated by military and intelligence agencies' interactions with the UFO public. He has undertaken a research study of the history of the MJ-12 controversy and intends to eventually publish his findings. He participates in discussions on the MJ-12 topic, by giving presentations to local UFO groups, appearing on internet podcasts and radio shows, and by communicating in social media. He is currently residing in the Washington, D.C. area in order to conduct documentary research at the National Archives and the Library of Congress. He recently published a paper titled MJ-12, The Counterintelligence Angle on tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com. The... Uh, First of all, welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us again. Champ and Frank, thank you for having me today. I'm glad to be here. We appreciate your time. I wanted to uh, talk about something that uh, took I, t- I took a keen interest in, that you took a lot of time, and it was a lot of hard work putting together. Uh, there's an article in particular we're going to discuss and to focus on that you wrote on at 9:10 of this year, it was titled MJ-12, the counterintelligence angle. Um, could you please uh, go over that article that you wrote? I was listening to a podcast. I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I try to keep up with what's going on in the UFO field, of course. But this particular pod- podcast was an interview uh, with with Greg Bishop. And Greg Bishop uh, has been a friend of Bill Bill Moore for many years. And in this uh, interview, Greg Bishop explained that apparently Bill Moore explained to him that the activities that Bill Moore, who was a very prominent, uh, even brilliant UFO researcher during the 80s and part of the 90s, but that Bill Moore explained to him that he felt that he was... Uh, being used as a source of information in a counterintelligence operation. Uh, Specifically, the thing that Bill Moore was involved in was uh, a series of countermeasures against an individual by the name of Paul Benowitz. Now, what Bill Moore did was he was interested in getting to the bottom of what the government knew about the UFO problem. And at the time, in the late 70s, UFO researchers had begun filing many Freedom of Information Act requests. And even a lawsuit had come up by Peter Gersten, an attorney out of New York. So, as well, Bill Moore had published his book, The Roswell Incident, in 1980. So, in addition to that, Leonard Stringfield had been publishing stories of crash saucers, recovered UFOs, and alien bodies. So what was happening was the UFO field was really, really starting to heat up. And after researching the Roswell incident, Bill Moore and Stan Friedman, I think, believed that it was possible that the government had recovered 
at least one UFO and alien bodies and maybe even a live alien. So Bill Moore was in a frame of mind to get to the bottom of what the government knew about UFOs. Now, the story goes that he was approached by uh, one or more individuals to kind of make a deal. He would inform on certain individuals and certain UFO groups and report back to his quote-unquote controller or controllers. And in, in exchange, they would pass to him certain documents. Now, they warned him that these documents might be partly true and partly false. So through this whole sequence of events in the 1980s, Bill Moore did come across several uh, so-called MJ-12 related documents, the uh, so-called Aquarius Telex and the Carter Briefing document, and then the uh, the actual MJ-12 documents, the Eisenhower Briefing document and the Truman Forrestal memo and the Cutler Twining memo. And while all this was going on, this individual by the name of Paul Benowitz, who was living right next to Kirtland Air Force Base, was taking pictures, he was taking photographs, he was taking uh, movie film, he was taking scientific measurements such, such as fluctuations in magnetic fields on Kirtland Air Force Base, and he was uh, maybe monitoring electronic signals. Well, Paul Benowitz had become a very firm UFO believer. He had gotten interested in the cattle mutilation problem in the 70s, and there was a lot of cattle mutilation activity in the Western United States, and particularly in the Mexico. Uh, Paul Benowitz was uh, associating with Gabe Valdez, who was a state policeman for New Mexico, in the Dulce Archuleta Mesa area. So by the time that Paul Benowitz started thinking that he was seeing UFOs on Kirtland Air Force Base and taking these measurements and photos, et cetera, et cetera, he actually approached Kirtland. And he spoke with this Mr. Uh, or Major uh, Edwards, who was in charge of uh, security at the time, and he approached him. Well, to make a long story short, he ended up working with Richard Doty. And Richard Doty was a special, uh, a special agent for the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And Richard Doty was one of the main contacts that Bill Moore was working with during this whole this whole era. And Bill Moore had at least one meeting with Doty and a person that Bill Moore uh, codenamed Falcon. He had at least one meeting with them, reporting back to them how, uh, how Paul Benowitz was reacting to the information that was being fed to him. And it's, it's, it's the conventional wisdom in the UFO community that Richard Doty and company fed information to Paul Benowitz so, so that he became so obsessed with this idea that there were UFOs and aliens and that there, uh, there were aliens abducting people uh, that uh, Paul Benowitz eventually reached the point to where he had a complete nervous collapse, complete physical and nervous collapse. And the conventional wisdom in the UFO community is it's all Richard Doty's fault. Now, the, the reason why I gave such a long explanation about all this is that Richard Doty has said, and Greg Bishop said in his interview, that all of this that was going on was really part of a much larger counterintelligence effort by the U.S. government. And the idea being, how many spies, particularly Soviet spies, or agents are there actually in the United States. And I think that Bill Moore has hinted that what he was involved in was part of a larger counterintelligence effort. And what I pointed out in my paper, Chant and Frank, was that if you look at the whole situation, the aerospace industry, the military, the scientific community, the government contractors, there's a whole lot of, there are a whole lot of opportunities for uh, 
the Soviets to possibly make, uh, you know, penetrate these organizations. Yeah. So uh, a couple, a couple of things. Uh, a couple things really quick, Tom. Uh, number one, if uh, what Moore is saying is accurate and that uh, uh, this whole effort uh, is uh, counter intel, uh, doesn't it uh, uh, pretty well expose uh, any Majestic 12 documents as being part of that effort and therefore uh, just being essentially fiction? That's why I titled it MJ-12, the counterintelligence angle, because I think that these documents uh there may be a grain of truth in some of them. And whether the documents are phony and whether MJ-12 or something like it existed or exists are really two different issues. But I, but uh, Greg Bishop left me with the impression, and I think he left the audience with the impression, that Bill Moore, after investigating all of this information that he found on these documents, eventually came to the conclusion that most of it was not useful. And uh, he, uh, okay, and uh, yeah, I, and again, uh, just uh, uh, additionally following up, uh, uh, what evidence exists other than uh, the claims of Moore uh, that uh, the effort uh, is, in fact, uh, counterintelligence? What evidence exists? Yeah, well, I mean, other uh, than Richard, his claiming it, and uh, he came to that conclusion. Richard Doty, in, in many interviews, and I, I've taken notes on at least 13 interviews that Richard Doty has given on in various uh, capacities on the Internet and so on and so forth. But he has repeatedly stated that the uh, Paul Benowitz affair was part of a, of a larger counterintelligence operation. And now, now, again, uh, what uh, evidence does he have that it was part of a larger operation? And it wasn't just the fact that uh, Doty happened to be working at Kirtland. He was a uh, counter-intel uh, Fosey guy. Uh, Benowitz happened to live across the street. And that it wasn't something just larger. It was just uh, uh, something that popped up in their neighborhood and they had to deal with it. And it didn't go any further than that. Well, one of the clues, and I mentioned this in my paper, but... Uh, uh, Ron Pandolfi, who was a CIA employee, told Bruce McAbee, a well-known UFO researcher, that in the 1970s, the CIA was concerned that the Soviets might be trying to exploit UFO enthusiasts to get certain information. And that is not just a rumor, because that is actually mentioned in a history of the CIA and UFOs that you can get off the, the internet that was written by uh, Richard Haynes, who is a, a National Reconnaissance Office historian. So those are two clues right there that there, there was concern about that. Yes, he also worked for NASA. I wanted to go over some of the uh, names that you've mentioned, and I'm just going to give our listeners a little bit of background information regarding some of the uh, folks that you have injected into the topic here. Uh, Paul Benowitz, uh, there was a little bit of uh, a blurb written by Greg Blish, uh, Bishop for his book titled uh, Project Beta. And uh, it, it goes like this. In 1978, Paul Benowitz, an electrical physicist living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, became convinced that the strange lights he saw hovering in the night sky were extraterrestrial. He reached out to newspaper senators and even the president before anyone responded. Air Force investigators listened to his story, as did Bill Moore, the author of the first book of the uh, on the infinite, infamous uh, Roswell UFO incident. Unbeknownst to Benowitz, Moore was hired by a group of intelligence agents to keep tabs on Benowitz while the Air Force ran a psychological profile and disinformation campaign on the unsuspecting physicist. In return, Air Force intelligence would let Moore in on classified UFO material. Moving along, we also have Rick Doty. Rick Doty, according to his LinkedIn profile, uh, we have here, he says, uh, State uh, Sergeant with the uh, New Mexico State Police, and uh, that was for 22 years and six months regarding his having been a staff sergeant. Um, then uh, as far as the New Mexico police, that goes back to um, uh, 1988, but I think that uh, he served longer for the New Mexico State Police uh, for, I think it was 26 years and seven months because he wasn't sergeant for the entire time. And then he was also a combat controller for the United States Air Force, employed from 1977 to uh, 79. And that was in McCord Air Force Base, Washington. 
And then also, uh, I think you also mentioned uh, Bill Moore. I'll go ahead and read a little bit on him. William Leonard Moore, born in uh, 1943, is an author and former UFO researcher, prominent from the late 1970s to the late 80s. He co-authored two books, as you know, Tom, with uh, Charles Berlitz, including The Roswell Incident. And uh, that was from uh, Wikipedia. And then we also have you follow just Jamie Shandera, which you will uh, hopefully uh, touch on that topic if you so desire later on. Uh, we also had uh, Bruce Maccabee, you mentioned. And he was, uh, he is, he was born in 42 and is an optical, optical, uh, American optical physicist, formerly employed by the U.S. Navy and a leading ufologist. Um, and then Peter Gersten, uh, last person I'm going to mention for right now. I will mention a few more later on in the podcast. And that is, uh, he's an attorney. He uh, was uh, uh, well known for having uh, been director of Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, as you stated before, which is CAUSE. That's the acronym for it, which is a nonprofit organization founded in 77. The headquarters were uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, it's a freedom, uh, Citizens Against UFO Secrecy is a freedom of information activist group that advocates for the release of classified information regarding UFOs. Um, so th that's just a little bit of background regarding that topic. And Frank, uh, I just you, want to uh, jump in here a little bit yeah. more on Doty. I mean, we've also uh, seen Doty uh, recently on uh, a national uh, cable television show claim that uh, the U.S. government knows that the extraterrestrials are from Zeta Reticuli as well. So he said a lot of things. And uh, I know you know this, Tom, and uh, Ron Pandolfi has as well with his uh, with his princess and his uh, portals and uh, some of those other claims. Uh, how do you uh, uh, how do you measure that? the kind of uh, wild uh, claims that uh, uh, Doty has made and uh, Pandolfi has made too with uh, some of the uh, other uh, maybe more grounded things uh, uh, that they've had to say, but uh, those things don't necessarily, uh, uh, aren't necessarily backed up by uh, anything other than they're saying it. Yes, and that's, but even for more conventional things, Frank, like certain counterintelligence activities or countermeasures, uh, it's it's unlikely that we can get to the root of that because all that information is likely going to be classified anyway. But Richard Doty has repeatedly stated in, in a number of interviews, and I've taken copious notes, that he, was br he received a briefing in 1979. Uh, he had been certified as an AFOSI special agent, and he's claim he claims that a colonel flew down from Washington I believe this is in the summer of 1979, and briefed him and upwards of maybe five to ten other people in the room. And they showed him film of the Roswell recovery, uh, you know, uh, perhaps the uh, uh, bodies that were recovered. They showed that him, uh, they showed them photographs and film, uh, really substantive evidence of UFOs in action. Uh, showed them photographs of these very strange-looking aliens. And the way that Richard Doty tells it was he, he said he, after he went through that, he was driving home and he had to pull over by the side of the road. And he, the, the, he said that the people in the briefing were asking the colonel, is this some kind of a setup? You know, is this phony? And, and the colonel assured them that, it's, that it was true. So, I mean, that's the story that Richard Doty tells. And there is no way, it, I, we can file FOIAs until we're blue in the face, and no way are they going to, if it is true, are they ever going to admit that. And again, uh, just to jump in really quick, uh, I don't know how closely you followed uh, the Bob Lazar story, but a lot of the things that Doty has said uh, and uh, stated as being true, uh, Lazar uh, said he was briefed while he was working at Area 51 and was told a lot of the same things. Uh, have you looked into his story at all? And uh, do you think it's uh, uh, what he's had to say is a uh, disinfo, counter intel, that type of thing? Uh, uh, where do, how, how do you fit him into all this if you do it all? Well, I don't know what to make of him, and I'm reluctant to take a hard line on Bob Lazar. Now, Doty has claimed that he uh, worked at so-called Area 51 on a couple of different occasions uh, in a counterintelligence capacity, and he said, Doty has said that he was not cleared to go anywhere except for maybe the, uh, the ground level 
of S4, and he said that Bob Lazar worked further underground there. So he, he got a little bit specific about that. Now, the problem with Bob Lazar is he 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 doesn't really fit the mold of a, some really top-rated physicist, and his uh, academic background, we're unable to verify that. Stanton Friedman went through all of that. So that... Well, that I, those I, I would take it further facts. than that and say he lied about that, but okay. <laughs> well, I, but I, I, I'm reluctant to take a hard line because we can't, it's so difficult to get to the root information on, on these claims, and there have been a whole series of claims over many years. Okay, Tom, I had a uh, question I wanted to ask you first. I'm going to go ahead and read a quote, uh, an excerpt from your article uh, that you wrote on the MJ-12 topic on 910 of this year. I'm going to go ahead and bre- begin that excerpt. The period of the 80s were just the beginning of a pattern of questioned documents and claims appearing from uh, through 2017. Although a discussion of these items is beyond the scope of this paper, we are left with the question. If the original MJ-12 set were related to counterintelligence efforts, are the same techniques being used up to the present day? We are reminded of the games intelligence agencies play in the following reference. For example, the published stories about our Star Wars program were replete with misinformation and forced the Russians to expose their sleeper agents inside the American government by ordering them to make a desperate attempt to find out what the U.S. was doing. But we could not risk exposure of the administration's role and take the chance of another McCarthy period. So, there were no prosecutions. We dried up and eliminated their access and left the spies withering on the vine. Nobody on the Joint Chiefs of Staff ever believed we were going to build Star Wars, but if we could convince the Russians that we could survive a first strike, we win the game. UFO researchers like to think that they are being watched, although they may have grounds to suspect such. The reasons may be completely different from what they want to believe. You yes. said you said a lot there. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, we've we've had a when the, when the MJ-12 documents started coming out in the 1980s, it didn't stop there. We also had the Bob Lazar claims that Frank just mentioned. We had a document mailed to Don Berliner, who is uh, another person in the UFO field. And that document was mailed to him in a roll of film, very similar to the way that a roll of film was, was mailed to Jamie Chandray and Bill Moore. And this, this became known as the Psalm 1-01 manual. And uh, critics have found 20 things wrong with that. Then you have uh, the Timothy Cooper documents. And most of, the, most of the MJ-12, or most of the documents that are directly related to MJ-12 are on the Woods website, mj12documents.com. And this is a, these are a number of documents involved in that. And then you have the claims from Dan Burrish, who claimed that he was, you know, kind of in an analogous capacity of working at Area 51 with a live alien. Then we had some, we, then we had Serpo. Right. And then we've also had another document come out in 2017, that I call it the ultra top secret document. And then a few, a few days ago, I was watching one of Linda Howe's presentations, and she was waving around this pretty thick document that she says was MJ-12 related. So what I'm trying to say is this is going on up to the present day with very similar techniques. And this is why I asked, asked the question, if it was part of a counterintelligence program in the 80s, are they still using the same, you know, the same tactics up to this day? Now, or, 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 or uh, maybe the simpler explanation, Tom, is that uh, Doty is still alive. He's still doing this sort of thing. And uh, he's uh, you know, just uh, acting as a private sector opportunist to gin up interest in, in, uh, in himself, uh, get interviews, uh, uh, get attention for himself, uh, possibly uh, try to sell a, a movie script, uh, which uh, uh, there have been some reports that he's been working on, that uh, maybe and uh, for his own personal entertainment. I mean, uh, there's a uh, uh, that's uh, that, that's the the direction that, uh, frankly, I'm leaning in. And uh, what do you think about all that? 
Well, it's a possibility. I mean, that's that's the pure hoax theory, that one or more individuals are just creating hoaxes out of whole cloth. Okay. So, Tom, I would like for you to correct me on this if I'm incorrect, so please do. And Frank also, my understanding is Rick Doty uh, admitted to the public that he was trying to deceive them in various ways regarding various topics. Sure. Um, uh, related to, I, I, be, I believe it was the UFO topic. I guess I could generalize in that manner. Um, uh, now, my question to you is, if he has admitted that to the public, why should we believe him at all on anything? Well, in the first place, a lot of the bad reputation that Doty received arose out of his activities during the 1980s, both in his relationships with Bill Moore and other UFO researchers, such as Linda Howe, and with Paul Benowitz. Now, when, when we wouldn't even know about that if Bill Moore hadn't gone public in 1989. He gave a talk at the MUFON Symposium in Las Vegas, and he explained this relationship that I mentioned earlier, he, he had gotten into a relationship with one or more intelligence agencies, apparently in exchange for getting certain information. And the UFO community, in one way, he was trying to warn the community. Now, I think that it's possible that Bill Moore was burned by, by his controllers and that his talk in 1989 was his revenge. It was his touche. Okay. Because now, you feel that Bill Moore was double crossed. Yes. Okay. Or, or he, re he realized that he had been played. Okay. okay. Now, when, so the UFO community gets wise to this whole idea that one, they're being monitored, two, one or more individuals are spreading disinformation and so on and so forth. So that, then they go to Richard Doty and they start peppering him with questions and accusations. And Doty is evasive because for one thing, he's still under uh, confidentiality. He's still under non-disclosure at the time. So he was evasive. Now, Doty has explained that uh, his uh, non-disclosure agreement was for 25 years. And you'll notice that after that 25 year period, Let's say if we take 1979 and add 29, 25 to it, uh, after that after that time period, he can't. He started coming out public, in public, and started uh, making these statements and making these claims. Uh, really okay. quick, uh, really quick, Tom. Uh, have you seen the film Mirage Men? And uh, what were your thoughts about that? If you have, well, Mirage, Mirage Men, of course. Yes. You know, yeah. it leaves a it, it leaves you with a very negative impression of Doty. Yes, and that's uh -huh. why I mentioned what I did. But but this is this is the conventional wisdom. Now, Do if you ask Doty about Mirage Men, he'll he'll tell you that they really screwed him around on that deal, and they edited it in such a way as to make him look bad. So that okay. that's his side of the story. But wouldn't it be fair to say? That no matter what he said, whether it was taken in or out of context, that his statements stand alone as they are. I think that as researchers, we need to be careful with the claims that Dodi makes. Okay. But at the same time, I don't take the position that he's this sociopathic. Uh, compulsive liar, and you can't believe anything that he says. I don't take that position either. And uh, just to follow up, uh, Doty's been uh, featured uh, a couple other times, and uh, my guess is that uh, you have seen these. Yeah, he was also featured rather extensively in not the most recent Stephen Greer film, but the one before that, Unacknowledged, where Greer uh, painted him quite differently than uh, the way Doty claims he was uh, uh, portrayed in Mirage Men, that he was uh, a heroic whistleblower. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, if you saw it? Well, there's, there's one thing that I have noticed about Doty, and he seems to be the only AFOSI special agent who is going out in public and making these claims that the government has all of the secret UFO knowledge. You know, why is he the only one? 
uh, that that's an unanswered question for me. Okay. Uh, one and uh, again, uh, also to follow up, in the first season of Unacknowledged, in one of the later episodes, I think it might have been episode five, uh, they seem to take a, a lot of umbrage over Dodie's work and that uh, Elizondo in particular uh, sort of uh, 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 charged back at him uh, saying that uh, the accusations that he's just another Richard Doty are false and that uh, he's nothing like him at all. Your thoughts on that, that they felt that they needed to address Doty uh, in the show? I mean, I thought that was rather significant that they did it. Well, I think that that's because things have become circular, Frank, and there was a lot, there's been a lot of consternation and unhappiness about what happened during the 1980s, you know, with Moore and Doty and all that. And now you have some people that have government backgrounds like Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, Jim Simi Van, et cetera, et cetera. And certain people are taking the position, well, they're from the government, so they must be here to spread disinformation and you can't, you, they can't be trusted. I don't think that's right, okay? Because for one thing, that's fighting the last war. And this is a different situation now. And my personal opinion is that they, ha they have good intentions. Now, I just, uh, go ahead. So that's. Oh, that's okay. So I just wanted to, uh, uh, Frank brought up something really important, I think, and that's Mirage Man. I watched that movie because Frank recommended it. I thought it was I great. I had to bug you to watch it, and you yes, finally I know. did. <laughs> I know. Well, I do, and I just want to say something personal here. I actually do a lot of UFO slash ET related research. And so when somebody asks me to see something, Frank actually does know this to be true. I spend every day and every night um, and databases all over the world looking for as much UFO slash ET related uh, historical data as I can. So it just adds to my list of other media uh, for me to, uh, to watch. But anyway, I wanted to inject in this discussion a little bit about Mirage Men, what it's about. It says it is a 2013 documentary directed by John Lundberg, written by Mark Pilkington, uh, who did write a book on it, and co-directed uh, by Roland Denning and uh, uh, Kipros uh, Kipriano. Uh, Mirage Men is about how the U.S. government used mythology to cover up their advanced technology. It prominently features Rick, uh, Richard Doty, a retired special agent who worked for FOSI, as you said, Tom, the United States Air Force Office of Special Investigation. And uh, Mark Pilkington's book about the project, also called Mirage Man, was published in 2010. Now, moving along, I wanted to mention another topic. Uh, there's an individual oh, a little... Yeah, uh, uh, before ahead. you do, Chad, let, yeah. me, let me interrupt again really yeah. quick. Uh, I believe that Mirage Man is available over on YouTube for free with advertisements. Oh, so uh, people can that. watch it for themselves and uh, make their own judgment. And it's important Frank did say that because uh, not a lot of people, especially during this period of time, kind of uh, economy that we have uh, people can't just afford you know every movie for five or six bucks so being able to see it for free is really important thank you for uh, letting us know that now uh, Tom wanted to let you know about uh, a certain topic I wanted to bring up it's, it sounds a little cloak and dagger or shadowy uh, individual possibly maybe you you tell me uh, Falcon, which is one of the uh, avian uh, aviary-related names that we hear often on the UFO community. Uh, Harry Rositsky, can you give us a little bit of information on him? Harry Rositsky, uh, I believe he had, I don't know if he got a PhD, but he had a degree in linguistics from Harvard. And I, I think I think he was an instructor there, but he, he was in the... Uh, uh, whatever it was before the CIA, I'm having a senior moment. And he was in the CIA, and he was a, he was a CIA uh, case officer, and his specialty was uh, Soviet, Soviet Union. So he was running agents in Eastern Europe, and he also, uh, you know, worked worldwide. I believe that he was involved in a, a uh, uh, situation in India, and he had a long history of working in the CIA. Well, the, the, the idea is, is that he was brought out of retirement to assist in, this, in these countermeasures in this counterintelligence program, and that Bill Moore uh, never disclosed the identity of Falcon until after uh, Harry Rositsky passed away. And Greg Bishop tells the story that uh, he and Bill Moore had gone out to a location to look at something, but that... Uh, Greg Bishop had really 
tried to figure out who who Falcon was, mm-hmm. and he, and uh, Bill Moore made him keep guessing, but he finally admitted that it was Harry Rosicki. Understood. Another uh, possible aviary member was Bruce Maccabee. Yeah, he was he was given a navy or the these people were circulating, you know, with certain aspects of the government. For example, Bruce Maccabee would give brown bag lunch talks at the CIA, and uh, so he had some connections at the CIA. And we've heard about Doty and more. Peter Gersten, uh, I think, had been approached by by Richard Doty, and in this. You know, you talk about Mirage Men, but I've got at least 10 references, 10 sources that I'm using in working on this paper about this whole era. And I found in my own, in the timeline that I've been working on that it was Peter Gersten that suggested that Linda Howe get in touch with Richard Doty. And then we have the sequence where Linda Howe uh, has this appointment with Richard Doty at Kirtland and she's shown you know, this Carter briefing document. And then Bill Moore apparently was shown the same document, but under much more cloak and dagger circumstances. Uh, really quickly, uh, we know about the Eisenhower briefing document. That's obviously one of the more uh, famous Majestic 12 documents. Uh, this Carter briefing document, is that readily available? Because that, uh, that one's yeah, new to yes. me. Yes, you can get, you can find it on the internet. Um, it's, uh, it's longer than the uh, than the Eisenhower briefing document, and it mentions a lot of these projects like Project Red Light and Project Snowbird and so on and so forth. And a lot of these project names ended up being spread around by uh, uh, William Cooper later in the 80s. So uh, the Carter it's called the Carter briefing document, but the the legend is that this is what uh, Car- uh, President Carter was briefed on when he became President of the United States. And uh, you had mentioned the, the Serpo documents, and uh, one of those documents is uh, allegedly a uh, transcript of a briefing for President Reagan. Have you had the opportunity to look that over, and uh, what are your thoughts about that? I'm not as familiar with that, Frank. I have not studied the so-called Reagan briefing. I've, I've seen it brief, you know, briefly. Um, but, you know, we, uh, Bob, Bob Collins, Robert, uh, Robert Collins, who was Condor in the UFO cover-up live program, he claims that the UFO cover-up live program was the Reagan disclosure. And there's, there's enough material in all this that I think you have to study, study it all and look at it all historically and try to get up to 20, 30,000 feet and try to see the big picture. I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't look at Mirage Men, but I don't think you should only look at Mirage Men. Okay, uh, I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about John Lear um, and uh, just mention a, a little bit about him and then ask you a question. Um, I hope I'm not incorrect in saying this, but I believe his father helped to design the, the Learjet or had a very significant uh, part to play regarding that uh, famous Learjet that we have uh, now. Uh, anyway, uh, John Lear, who's now 77 years old, he spent 40 years as a commercial pilot and holds the most FAA airman certificates ever issued by the FAA to a single pilot, including airline transfer pilot. And uh, actually, that list is very long. So moving along, uh, uh It sounds like, and he has quite a bio, I mean, it goes on for actually many pages. Um, He's made quite a few claims in the UFO community historically, uh, just about various topics. Um, I'll be frank with you, I don't know that I believe all of them. I wanted to ask you, what part do you feel that he had to play with the MJ-12 topic? According to Christian Lambride, uh, John Lear went down and visited with Paul Benowitz, and <clears throat> Bill Moore came out with his uh, information about the Eisenhower briefing document and the Truman Forstall memo in 1987, and that's about when John Lear started coming out with his his uh, theories. 
And I think he talked to some people. I think he talked to maybe a couple of people in the so-called aviary, maybe Robert Collins. Uh, maybe he talked to Richard Doty yeah. uh, and, and so on and so forth. And quite frankly, I agree with you. I'm very, very skeptical of just about every claim that John Lear makes. Uh, he's even said that there are something like 5 billion people living inside the sun, you know, something uh, outrageous like that. So I think he, he came in late in the game. He didn't really become more prominent until the later 80s. In fact, in, it was in 1989 uh, that he was supposed to be running the MUFON Symposium in Las Vegas, and there was this brouhaha. Uh, he wanted certain people to talk, and, including William Cooper, and uh, he actually split off and had his own little show, you know, in Las Vegas, separate from oh. MUFONs. Well, wasn't that the same year that uh, uh, the uh, the other Bill, I'm getting confused with Cooper, and uh, the other Bill, uh, the Bill one Moore. who worked with... Uh, uh, Bill Moore, sorry about yeah. that. I, I had my senior moment there. Uh, the, <laughs> was that wasn't that the, the same? Uh, wasn't that the same day? Like uh, the the one was sort of uh, uh, the one with Moore was uh, sort of down the street from the one with uh, with Lear in the late eighties when uh, uh, Moore made his uh, uh, his uh, revelation about uh, uh, being uh, used uh, as a, a counter intel tool. Do you remember that? It was either or, the same day or the same week. I mean, yeah, they were yeah. right, you know, right at the same time. Yes. So it was, it was would have been an interesting uh, day to be in Vegas. <laughs> yeah. And that was, I didn't actually get active in the UFO field until a little bit after that, about around 1990 or so. Um, by the way, part of his bio states that in April of 1977, John penetrated the security area of 51 and took the only pictures ever taken by a civilian of our Russian fighter uh, in front of a hangar. Anyway, I uh, wanted to mention something else. Uh, and that is, I believe, that John Lear was a director uh, for MUFON in uh, Las Vegas during the period of time that George Knapp was covering Bob Lazar. Um, okay, so I just wanted to ask you um, a few more questions. He was a state director for Nevada at, the, at the time of that symposium. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thanks for confirming that. Uh, now, Barry Greenwood, who is a well-known uh, UFO researcher, uh, he's a veteran researcher. We have a deep respect for him and his uh, his uh, fantastic work on behalf of the UFO community and also just for ev everybody, really, who's a UFO enthusiast or uh, curious about the UFO topic. Um, he wrote a book, Clear Intent, the Govern Government Cover-Up of the UFO Experience, which was published in 84, and uh, his co-author, Lawrence uh, Fassett, that discussed uh, that book discusses the government's top secret investigations of UFO sightings and argues that the government possesses secret proof of the existence of UFOs. Uh, what part does he have to play regarding the MJ-12 topic? He was involved in the uh, publication of the Just Cause newsletter. Um, and this came into play, I think, more in the second half of the 1980s. But later, uh, some years later, with Brad Sparks, uh, Barry Greenwood and Brad Sparks wrote a brilliant paper about the origins of MJ-12. And it was based on uh, transcripts or tapes that brought Bob Pratt had taken uh, of conversations with Bill Moore. Uh, the idea being that uh, Bill Moore and Richard Doty were interested in writing a book about what uh, what Bill Moore believed what were the secrets that the government was keeping about you know these recovered UFOs and so on and so forth, and uh, Bob Pratt apparently told him that they 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 couldn't verify nonfiction information and that that it should be written as a a fiction uh, version of the story, and uh, I don't know if Bob Pratt actually wrote a draft, but it never came to anything. A, bu a book was never published. But uh, Greenwood and Sparks really get into some fascinating details in this whole sequence. And uh, it, it's one of the, the sources that I use, both in creating my Benowitz timeline and in writing this paper. Okay, let's uh, talk just a little bit about Brad Sparks. 
Uh, can you fill us in on his background just a little bit, uh, maybe uh, so that our listeners are become more familiar with him regarding his being a researcher? Well, he's a very, very, very good researcher. And he, he goes, I know he goes at least back to the 70s. Uh, he, he's been associated, I think, mainly with uh, the Center for UFO Studies and some with MUFON. Uh, and I've actually had conversations with him in the hall at, at a MUFON symposium several years back. I, I was doing mostly uh, research on the internet about MJ-12, and I was, I was really uh, having a lot of questions. And I had conversations with Stan Friedman, too, which is kind of comical. But uh, I, I can't really give you a detailed biography about Brad Sparks right here, but he is a very well-established and a very highly competent researcher. Well, I wanted to uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, State Police Officer Gabe Valdez and uh, wanted to mention before I ask you my question um, that uh, Gabe Valdez, uh, uh, he actually, his uh, son, uh, uh, wrote a book called Dulce Base, The Truth and Evidence from the Case Files of Gabe Valdez by his son, Greg Valdez. And... uh, uh, it's it's I'm not trying to act like a grammar Nazi here or anything, but um, the book is not written that well if you're into syntax and grammar and stuff like that. Um, I know guilty. OK, but anyway, uh, it, it, I think he needed an editor for this book. But uh, just to mention a little bit about the summary of this book, it states um In 1976, Gabe Valdez became one of the leading investigators into the cattle mutilation mystery that was spreading across the U.S. based on his employment with the New Mexico State Police. As he started investigating the mutilations on the Gomez Ranch outside of Dulce, New Mexico, he stumbled into much more than he bargained for. His investigative uh, findings led to a close friendship with Paul Benowitz, who was involved in a massive government government-authorized disinformation campaign originating out of Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The harrowing tale of Paul Benowitz led to the story of the alleged underground alien bases near Dulce, New Mexico. For the first time, you will see what really happened in Dulce. I can't read anymore. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's just... uh, Anyway, moving along, I wanted to ask you, uh, Tom, um, is it possible that... uh, State police officer Gabe Valdez may have innocently and not just not meaning to in any way, shape or form played on the paranoid flags going off like sirens, probably for Paul Benowitz. Because here, let me go ahead and give a little bit more info on my question. I suspect it's possible that Gabe Valdez was equally as stymied at times regarding what was going on. And my understanding is he communicated with Paul ben- Benowitz off and on. So I'm just wondering, I'm guessing this is uh, this is not a fact. It's just a question on my part. Is it possible that he may have been as paranoid to a degree about the topics we're discussing as Paul Benowitz was, and that caused Paul to also become a little bit more amped up in his paranoia? Well, here's, here are a couple of things that were going on. There, Like I mentioned, there, there were extensive cattle mutilation problems happening in the western United States and in New Mexico. Gabe Valdez had been investigating them. Gabe Valdez, and maybe even Paul Benowitz as well, saw some strange things going on on Archuleta Mesa. They saw lights and so on and so forth. Richard Doty claims that he, when he was working with AFOSI out of Kirtland, that he went up and checked with a special operations group in Colorado, and they confirmed that they had been conducting exercises on Archuleta Mesa. For example, they had spotlights that pointed straight up so that the helicopters knew where to land and and all this. So if Gabe Valdez and possibly Paul Benowitz were driving around the Archuleta Mesa area 
and they, you know, they saw these hovering lights and they saw these lights shoot, shooting up out of the mesa and so on and so forth. You can understand how they might have felt that, hey, something really strange is going on up there. Now, it's one thing to realize that uh, it appears to be very strange. It's another thing to become completely convinced that it's an underground alien base and that the aliens are invading. Right. Now, I can tell you from the study that I've done on the Paul Benowitz affair that I believe that by the time that he was fully in touch and had these meetings with actually a fairly large number of people on Kirtland Air Force Base, and this is around uh, October 1980, that by the time that he got to that point, he was well on his way to being really off, almost off the deep end about aliens. You know, uh, that deep end aspect, which is mentioned often, um, and one of the authors I mentioned uh, regarding their bios actually said he went utterly insane. Um, how do we know that? I am not saying it didn't happen, but I want our listeners who are kind of like novice to this topic. They, this is the first time they've heard about it and they're wondering, well, gee, why is this poor person, Paul Benowitz being accused of having gone totally insane? Um, and, uh, you know, how do we know that? Can you please, for our listeners, detail why folks suspect that he may have gone over the edge? Well, we don't. We, I think we'd have to interview his family members. And uh, Paul Benowitz had a business called Thunder Scientific Labs. Right. And it's still going today. You can look it up on the Internet. Okay. Now, I don't know if his family members want to talk to anybody about it. But Richard Doty has, has said that... Uh, Paul Benowitz had become extremely paranoid. Bill Moore has said the same thing. These are people that visited Paul Benowitz at his home and that knew him, even as a friend. Uh, Leo Sprinkle, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, said that that Paul ben he, when he went to Paul Benowitz's house, Benowitz was carrying pistols and a rifle, you know, and he was paranoid that the aliens were after him. Uh, I know that Christian Lambright uh, had the same same impression about Paul Benowitz. So we have three, four, five or more people saying who knew Paul Benowitz who had visited with him saying that he he had reached this state of really extreme paranoia and upset. Well, uh, do we know if he was hospitalized prior to his suicide or anything like that? Uh, I have heard that he was that he's he was hospitalized and maybe more than once. Now, I've heard the word suicide, but I I haven't heard very much about that, and I'm not inclined to believe that until I see a death certificate, and I don't think you can get to that. You know, and the state the state records wouldn't release that. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle is one reason why I got involved um, in the UFO topic, um, among many other folks who dedicated their lives to the UFO topic. Um, he actually uh, studied a really interesting case. I just wanted to mention a little bit about it. Uh, it was uh, the uh, case of a an individual who lived in Wyoming, which is where Dr. Leo Sprinkle uh, practiced um, and uh, had his practice. And it was a first-person story. It's called, uh, by the way, I'm going to mention a book here. Uh, written by one of the relatives of the individual who allegedly went through this experience that Dr. Leo uh, Sprinkle actually studied and spoke to the individual as well. It's called Alien Abduction of the Wyoming Hunter, First Person Story of Carl Higdon, uh, which uh, says October 25th, 1974 is when uh, it happened. And uh, Marjorie A. Higdon is the author of that book. Um, he actually spoke to Carl Higdon and... Uh, uh, when I heard about that case, I was absolutely mesmerized. And uh, from that <laughs> from that point on, among many other stories I was researching regarding the UFO ET topic, um, thank you to Dr. Leo Sprinkle for having published information on it that he did, because it really, it, it caused me to become more enthusiastic and more acutely interested in the topic. But anyway, I uh, wanted to could ask... I, could I just I'm sorry, yeah. could I just point out one thing? Uh, Frank, you mentioned uh, Paul Benowitz dying, but 
Paul, according to the information that I have, Paul Benowitz reached a state of complete nervous and physical collapse in 1988. Richard Doty left the Air Force in October, November 1988. Paul Benowitz did not die until 2003. That was 15 years later. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. That's an excellent point. It's one that I'd run down in the past. Uh, uh, appreciate that. Oh, uh, doubling back, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, Valdez's work with the uh, Dulce underground base. And uh, I know uh, we're uh, straying a little bit, uh, but someone else who's gotten a little bit of traction, who's no longer with us, uh, uh, died under curious circumstances, is a uh, fellow by the name of Phil Schneider, who got uh, some mileage out of uh, right, uh, yeah. recounting some tales uh, regarding uh, the Dulce base, uh, claimed he was maimed as a result of his encounters yeah. uh, with aliens in there. Uh, have you looked at uh, his uh, material at all, and uh, uh, do you think it uh, has any merit whatsoever? Yes, I've I've heard his claims, and I know you don't like Richard Doty Frank, but Doty <laughs> says that it's a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, I don't care for uh, Phil Schneider uh, regarding his story. I think that uh, there are a few people who actually really researched his background and the stories he had to uh, to well his claims, and uh, through their hard uh, research or hard work. They discovered that there were a lot of holes in his story, and that he was contradicting himself and in the line. And, and stealing material from old Star Trek episodes, if you actually yeah. look at his presentation. Yeah. So, along you know. with on the uh, on Gabe Valdez's son's yeah. book. Yes. The thing that got me about that book was he had photographs of these small buildings on stilts mm-hmm. in the Archuleta Mesa area. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that they were surveillance platforms uh, to surveil these nefarious activities that were going on there. I looked at those. They're obviously hunting blinds. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's hilarious. Um, Now, there do not appear to be that many folks involved on the MJ-12 topic. Um, I believe that there was a book uh, written by a well-known uh, UFO, well, a well-known researcher uh, who also is involved in um, filling out uh, FOIAs whenever he feels he needs to uh, to find out more information from our government. Uh, his name is Christian Lambright, and I uh, believe he wrote a book called X Descending. Uh, Stanton Friedman wrote a book about it as well. Yes, and... Uh, so wanted to ask, uh, I think I saw that you had some reference notes to a few folks uh, dedicated to them in your article. Um, uh, how, in, how much did what Christian Lambright wrote, how much did that influence the topic, um, the MJ-12 article topic that you wrote? Well, in the interest of full disclosure, and to be completely honest, I had purchased X Descending uh, years ago and mm-hmm. read it. When I wrote my paper on MJ-12, the counterintelligence angle, I had completely forgotten that half of Christian Lambright's book is about Paul Benowitz. Okay. So uh, you and I, Chan, had had some conversations about that, and this has spurred me to really dig into the Paul Benowitz affair and try to pull up uh, all the readily available information that's out there. So right. I have reread. Christian Lambright's book, you know, you know, very carefully, and and a lot of the information he has in there about Paul Benowitz has gone into my timeline. Yeah, I didn't have yeah. much. To uh, and uh, yeah, let me uh, jump back in. Uh, uh, as far as uh, my opinions on Doty, I would say that uh, I uh, I don't believe anything that he has to say. I do believe that uh, he was involved in the concoction of the MJ-12 documents, and uh, uh, they've actually been really helpful to me. Uh, when I first started researching UFOs uh, a little bit more than a decade ago, it was sort of a, a, a cheat sheet where a lot of uh, that material was uh, actually very helpful to me, trying to dig through mountains of UFO information. And even though I always looked at it somewhat uh, more than a little skeptically, uh, there was enough 
uh, it's enough uh, based on fact. There's enough based on fact there that I actually found them very helpful. And I, I actually uh, kind of have the same opinion towards these uh, uh, Wilson docs that have been floating around over the last couple of years, that uh, there's enough material in there that provides leads uh, that is helpful. It's all kind of compiled into uh, one nice, uh, neat little package. And it's very helpful. I think uh, uh, the mistake, and it's not one that you're making, but I think that a lot of people do, is to either say, yes, this is... Uh, uh, literal truth. These are actual documents as compared with saying, well, these are really well researched. A lot of this stuff uh, uh, does actually check out. It's interesting. They're well researched and uh, let's see where we can go from here rather than just accepting them as uh, being 100% legitimate. So uh, just uh, wanted to clear that up a little bit. Good. I want to mention a few things. One is uh, I had asked Christian Lambright, who's a wonderful person, uh, to uh, join us on the show. I don't think he had the opportunity to do so. Um, however, <laughs> um, uh, it would have been nice to be able to hear a little bit of input he may have been able to share regarding his book and his past history with uh, having uh, been able to uh, to give us his insight, having known a few of the folks regarding this topic that we're talking about today. Um, so I did share with Tom that I was hoping that Christian Lambright would share, uh, would, would actually join us on the show, but he was not able to do so. So, uh, m my having talked with Tom Whitmore regarding Christian Lambright was limited to that respect and only, uh, just talking about his book. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I thought it was interesting in Mirage Men how, um, and Frank, you'll have to you'll have to correct me if I'm in, if I'm not right, okay? But in that movie, I I almost was pretty sure I remember that it was the the mutilations that were occurring out there in New Mexico in the Archuleta Mesa were due to a possible nuclear program, uh, uh, kind of a, a check on the radiation levels and yeah. the only way to find out more about that is to actually have cut up these poor creatures to find out if the radiation levels were at a certain point and evidently in that area i guess allegedly they were very high uh, can you fill us in a little bit more on that? I, I, I'd like yeah, to know I, more about it. You know, it. I have watched the movie, but it was a while ago, so I yeah, don't me remember too. that. <laughs> so, it's a little vague uh, I mean, me. if, if Tom's memory is uh, better on that than mine is, I, I don't recall well, that. Well, uh, just, just, this is just an aside, and I wanted Tom's input on it, aside from yours. Uh, so whoever jumps in first, that's on you guys. But, you know, the, uh, if it is true... That it turned out it was U.S. Air Force or what, whatever, whatever branch of our military was there dissecting these poor creatures to find out if there was uh, a, any level of radiation in their uh, tissues or organs or whatever. Um, and it was not, you know, some ET interference, uh, you know, some nefarious ET related program at all. Then it turns out that that mutilation, uh, that rash of them going on, had nothing to do with that topic. Thoughts on that? Well, I think this whole idea that the government was behind uh, mutilating the cows because of radiation, I have a lot of problems with that for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, Chant, I believe you're familiar enough with New Mexico, I believe that a lot of New Mexico land is Bureau of Land Management mm -hmm. land. So what's to stop the government from putting as many cows as they want wherever they think there's radiation, you know, and then do their testing that way? Mm -hmm. um, and another thing is, why not just go up to the ranchers? May we please buy, we'd like to purchase one or more of your cow or the cows. We're doing an environmental study, you know, and, and they could pay them 10 times what the cows are worth and yeah. cut them up to their hearts of content. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. To I, me I do have, do it that way. I do have something to say that. Um, if, if it was a top secret level type of program that they were doing being any branch of our government, um, or department, um, 
they would not want to ask them anything at all, meaning the farmers or the ranchers, because they don't want them to be privy to that kind of uh, level of knowledge. That's a guess. I'm not saying that's true. Yeah, I mean, the simple workaround of that is they, they just set up some kind of a shell company and they just say, I want to buy a couple of your cows. You, you know, it's very enough. easy for them to, to do that, too. So, yeah, if they, if they wanted true. to hide their tracks, you know, that's been done before. There's something folks can look up if they wish called Crypto AG. There is a faction of our uh, U.S. government that actually created a a, uh, a company in the manner you just stated, and they were actually uh, on the stock market. <laughs> so okay. uh, that anyway, yes, that is totally possible. However, you know, it's it's not unusual for a rancher um, or a farmer or anybody who just has one cow to milk, okay, out there. Uh, anywhere to say, no, I won't do it. And that's because they don't want to share or sell their animals to anybody. They have a certain relationship with them and that's just how it is. And it's been for generations in their families. So, uh, you know, the, it's quite possible that the U S government just felt like they didn't want any rumors to fly around at all about anything or any new companies in the area. You got to understand these are small areas in the Southwest. I mean, like, they probably have a few stop signs, one gas station, a very tiny population, a new company in any area that small. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of gossip flying around and people want to know all about them, that kind of thing. I think that the U.S. government, if that story is true regarding their having tested um, and mutilated these poor creatures, uh, you know, they they did it. They just did it, whether it was illegal or not. You may be right. I, I have a lot of problems with it. Now, I've been out to Dulce, New Mexico, and believe me, it's out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Now, it's not unusual for the U.S. government to ask an entire town to not say anything. That's been done before. I think it may have been Dulce. Folks will have to check on that. Uh, but uh, there were some uh, top secret or a secret level uh, type of programs going on somewhere in New Mexico. I believe it may have been Dulce where uh, towns folks were actually asked to sign something uh, in order to not uh, share any any information they might uh, observe or find out about. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm really glad we were able to, to cover that topic. Thank you so much. And uh, also, Tom, did you have any more information you wanted to share with us on the MJ-12 topic? Well, I could talk about it all day. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I've, I'm going to be working on a lot of different papers, and there are different uh, subjects. For example, uh, I've told you I've, I've been working on this Paul Benowitz paper, but I'm going to be working on a paper uh, that I'm going to title Before MJ-12. And it's a series of uh, events and claims and stories that occurred before this whole sequence uh, arose in the 1980s. And this is going back to the 40s and 50s and, and up through the years. So now, uh, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, for a little clarification, yeah. does this relate to uh, goings on within the UFO field? Or are you talking more about yes. looking at it uh, and the government end and what the government was actually doing regarding UFOs? I mean, it's a, it, it, it's not a secret. Uh, it's a matter of a, a public record that uh, Truman was briefed on a quarterly basis by his uh, Air Force uh, Chief of Staff, uh, uh, General uh, Landry. Uh, for example, yes. uh, that there were meetings in the White House uh, uh, regarding uh, UFO, uh, uh, the UFO incident uh, over Washington, D.C. in 1952. And uh, you know, the, the uh, Truman years are uh, pretty well covered. Uh, the Truman Library has done a really nice job as far as uh, uh, getting uh, a lot of information together. And some of that do, uh, does include the UFO stuff. Uh, the other libraries, maybe not quite as well, but uh, that period is pretty well covered. And it's uh, pretty interesting. Yes. Well, there there are just some things that I think in terms of general public uh, perception could have helped to contribute to the idea that something like MJ-12 could have existed. So I'm just going to go over a few of those things that have occurred over the years. Um, there's also the, the men in black angle and and I'm not talking about your uh, uh, your classic men in black but rather you know the government 
side of it. And Bill Moore pointed out in a very interesting but very obscure article, and I'm one of the very few people that has a copy of it, that he pointed out these this particular uh, group in the Air Force that, that does some nefarious things. They have actors, they have con men that can deceive people and do things. So I'm going to be uh, looking at that as well. And I'm going to be looking at MJ-12 from the counter, from the uh, psychological warfare angle, and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to refer to things that actually exist and, and not make claims, you know, that I can't support. Understood. Now, uh, 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 James Carrion's name has uh, come up <clears throat> in the past, and uh, you worked with him uh, as a, a part of MUFON uh, for a uh, time there. He was actually the MUFON director, and he resigned. He was uh, rather upset uh, regarding uh, the Bigelow money that uh, we know now uh, came uh, from the Pentagon, uh, the Bigelow money that was being uh, passed to MUFON. Uh, during the uh, during the run of the uh, uh, the ATIP program, uh, you worked with Carrion, and uh, he is of the opinion that the entire uh, uh, UFO field. Uh, I'm probably oversimplifying, but the entire uh, UFO field is a sort of a, a counter intel operation. Uh, uh, can you give us your thoughts on uh, Carrion and having uh, worked with him a little bit, and then uh, on his uh, high, uh, his thesis there? Yes. Well, uh, James Carrion. Uh, was in the military, and I think he worked in intelligence in some way or another. Now, a lot of people in the military work in intelligence, either directly or indirectly. And I think he had enough experience that uh, this uh, caused him to be to perceive certain things in, in the intelligence realm. And he ran across an article about a study that was being done in New Zealand about creating tsunamis with with uh, nuclear bombs, with atomic bombs. And he found that to be coincidental with certain other things that were that were going on at the time. And <clears throat> he he ran with that and started working on the thesis that the whole, well, that at least much of the UFO problem has arisen out of psychological warfare. Uh, efforts by the Air Force. And he goes back to the time of the ghost rockets in in Scandinavia. Uh, I think he did a lot of research at the National Archives. He did some good research, particularly concerning General Vandenberg, who he says was very involved in psychological warfare during World War II and carried this over into the 1950s. Um, I got the impression, like you did, Frank, that he thinks that the whole UFO problem was has been created by these psychological warfare uh, efforts. And it's similar to another gentleman, and I can't remember his name right now, another senior moment, but he, he, he believed that the CIA had created the whole perception about UFOs and that they were creating phony radar returns and so on and so forth. So there is this theory. All right. Well, thank you very much for having gone over the topic that we're all discussing so comprehensively. Tom, we're very appreciative of your time and uh, really am very grateful that you had the time to spend with us today on the show. And Frank, did you have any other questions? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I had to cut my mic a little bit there because uh, the neighbor decided to cut his lawn in the middle of our show here. Uh-huh. So uh, I wanted I wasn't sure if that was getting picked up on the air or not, but I wanted yep. to. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I wanted to, uh, to mute my mic. I just uh, I, again, uh, following up on Carrion, uh, it sounds like you, you think he's a, a serious, credible guy. But uh, uh, it seemed like if he really thought that or at least he was leaning towards that during his days uh, uh, in terms of uh, working with MUFON. I guess he didn't know that uh, Bigelow's uh, money backers were actually the Pentagon at that point. But uh, uh, why do you think? Why uh, did he express to you why he took such umbrage at? Uh, I guess it was uh, Cliff Clift uh, at that point in time, uh, saying, "Yeah, we'll take that money. Yeah, we'll do something with it from Bigelow." Do you know why he was so upset well, about that? Like you said, Frank, I was there, and we were presented with this opportunity from Mister Bigelow 
to have the opportunity to have a rapid response team. So if there was a promising UFO sighting or promising UFO event, it, it was our intention to be able to send a team there immediately. Okay. Now, MUFON does not have a lot of money for that on its own. So uh, Mr. Bigelow came in with lots and lots of money for this. And it was our intention. I know that the intentions were good on our side. Now, Mr. Bigelow did not disclose the source of the funds. And I can tell you, being a board member and knowing the other board members, we, have, we had the perception that the money was coming from private interests. You know, these uh, Lawrence Rockefeller types, the crown prince of Liechtenstein, maybe Bigelow himself. And it wasn't uh, yeah, and, and there was no reason to think otherwise. I mean, Bigelow has his means, and uh, uh, do you remember the amount? I mean, it wasn't uh, it wasn't millions uh, he was offering up to MUFON. It was, uh, do you remember the exact amount? I mean, it was a, a, well, a several thousand, I guess, but it wasn't a fortune, you know. I'm not going to quote an exact number, but it was, <laughs> it was material in, term, in MUFON terms. Right, okay? right. Now, it may, it may have been pocket change to him, but... Uh, Mr. Bigelow is very strict about money, and he, he wants an accounting for every penny. But uh, I think James Carrion got suspicious, and he was hearing about the Skinwalker Ranch situation. And I think that James actually went to the location and wanted to go onto the ranch, and, and he wasn't admitted. I think that he became suspicious of Bigelow and that he may have believed that the money was coming from the government. So he... He may have been ahead of us there. And then, of course, when this article came out in December 2017 in the New York Times, I read that thing and I put two and two together, you know, and realized where the money was coming from. Fascinating. Okay. Well, I think yeah. we I, I think we got a little uh, some inside poop there. That was uh, that was a pretty interesting stuff. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate I that. wanted to go ahead and rec recommend to everybody to please read that wonderful article that Tom took a lot of time doing uh, research and hard work on. He also has a complete list of citations and references, so folks can peruse through those at the, uh, I think, the bottom of the article. But they are included in the article that he wrote on uh, uh, 910 of uh, the, this year. It was titled MJ-12, The Counterintelligence Angle, uh, on uh, Tom Whitmore blog .wordpress.com. Now, I want to spell that out for our listeners so it's Tom, T-O-M, Whitmore, W-H-I-T-M-O-R-E, dot, oh, sorry, Tom Whitmore. So that's T-O-M-W-H-I-T-M-O-R-E, blog, dot wordpress dot com. Now, if you need to find that and you can't, what you can do is just type in Tom Whitmore blog, and you can also type in MJ space 12. And uh, on Google, hit enter, and you'll you'll probably find it. But we'll include oh. that link to the article Oops. underneath this podcast so that Thank you can you. find it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, let me uh, let me jump in uh, with one last thing now yes. that I've got uh, my memory banks properly engaged okay. here. <laughs> now right. I also want to go back uh, since uh, we're talking about uh, Bigelow's involvement with MUFON, and uh, I. I I still think that uh, some of the uh, the fine work that uh, some of the finest work that uh, MUFON's ever done uh, was related to that Stephenville case back in 2009. And uh, uh, I would think that uh, Bigelow was still involved with MUFON while that case was going on. Would that be about right, Tom? I don't think so. You don't no, think so? Okay. Think so. Okay. It, All right. it, it ended during that at the same time that uh, that uh, James Carrion left. Okay. As as executive director, and I would just like to point out, Chant, thank you for quoting my blog. There's also an audio version of that. If you go yes. on YouTube and type in Tom Whitmore MJ12, you should see it. There's a there's an image of an MJ12 document there, and you can listen to a a uh, audio version. Oh, good. Yes, and that's important that you did say that because uh, actually there are a lot of folks out there who don't have the ability. For whatever reason, whatever unknown or known reasons, they cannot read articles on the Internet. So being able to have the privilege of listening to them by audio is very, very important. So please do go on YouTube, type in Tom Whitmore, MJ Space 12. And so that's MJ, and then add a little space, 
and then type in 12, hit enter, and you should be able to find that audio. If you cannot, what you can also do is you can, a little trick here, go on Google, type in Tom Whitmore, then type in MJ, and then add in a space, type in 12, then add in YouTube, and you should be able to find that right away on Google, from Google. All right. Well, Tom, we thank you so much for uh, the time that you spent with us today, Frank. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was it was very questions. enlightening. It was very enlightening. Uh, always great to have you on, Tom. I sure yes. do appreciate it. We always enjoy having you on the show. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Jim. Yep. So uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, we do have the Thanksgiving holiday coming up towards yeah. the end of the month. I think we've got a couple weekends before Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, I don't think we have anything uh, quite firmed up yet on the uh, agenda, Chant. Uh, is that oh, about I right? Do. Oh, I you do. do. Oh, you do, I, but do I'm we? <laughs> not sure. This is not, I mean, it is for certain, but I don't always like saying, oh, this is for oh, certain. Right, okay, okay, okay. Know, so, so we may or may I, not uh, be back before Thanksgiving. And we well, definitely yeah. won't do anything Thanksgiving weekend for next, sure. Next weekend, I may be going somewhere to actually cover a UFO-related event. I'm not okay. going to say what it is. Okay. But I will be talking to an individual. Uh, hopefully, that may happen if he has the time. Who's known worldwide regarding the UFO topic. Uh, uh, there, let me put it this way: folks that are out of the UFO community, he's a household name. They okay. they all know who he is. Well, look, and, look. Uh, Hopefully, I'll have the opportunity to interview him for for all of us to be able to listen to what he has to say on the UFO slash ET topic. It's a, okay. it's a historical case. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. And uh, uh, we'll, 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 one way or the other, even if that doesn't pan out, that we'll certainly try to get in one show before Thanksgiving holiday. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, Tom, uh, thanks again for everything. And uh, everybody, thanks so much for listening. Uh, I think it was a great show full of surprises and some new information. And uh, we'll be back uh, when we're back. And uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and have a great day. Bye-bye now. Good night.